Hi everybody, Eric Albertson, one of the armor historians here at World War II Armor. Uh, we're here at D-Day Conneaut in Conneaut, Ohio. Uh, we just got finished with the, uh, the reenactment of the invasion of Normandy where the uh, Allied armor, the U.S. and both the uh, Commonwealth armor stormed the beach. Uh, while here at D-Day Conneaut for World War II Armor, uh, one of our main missions is to focus and teach about the history of the U.S. armor battalions that landed on Omaha and Utah because of a lot of myths out there and so we try to correct that myth through history in motion and also while here on the tank line with everybody. And uh, today we have a very special guest uh, who flew all the way across from England, Mr. Jim Holland. Uh, thanks for being here with us, Jim. Oh no, it's, thank you for having me, it's been fantastic. It's been an honor with uh, having Jim with us. He's been embedded with our organization, uh, you know, seeing what it's like uh, operating historic armored vehicles that are 80 plus years old. And so, what I'd like to do for a lot of our followers and uh, folks in our World War II Armor online community is kind of focus and talk a little bit uh, on some of the British armor, the tankies, mm -hmm. uh, our colleagues from the pond, across the pond, yep. about some of the uh, British armor that landed on D-Day. Would you do that with me, Jim? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Well, I mean, the, the, the British, British did things so they have, they had divisions, armored divisions, and they're in kind of reserve, they're the mobile reserves, and they're not landing on D-Day. But what you have attached to infantry divisions, a circle around kind of 16,000 infantrymen and, and the company parts that you get in a, in a whole division, um, is an independent armored brigade. So this is an armored brigade that is op operating outside of the divisional structure. Okay. And uh, they are there directly to support the infantry. But you've got a kind of weird imbalance because an infantry division is commanded by a major general. Mm -hmm. and they're a brigade, so they're one rank down. So how it works is you have three infantry brigades in an infantry division, each with three battalions, mm -hmm. you know, 890 men or whatever it is. Yep. And you would have a, uh, in an armored brigade, you'd have three armored regiments, each of about like 62 Sherman tanks and 11 Stuarts. Okay. And now, were they, were they, do you, do you recall, and I'm just shooting from the hip, do you recall if they were uh, M3 Honeys or M5 Stewarts, the later model at that time? Do you recall? Or? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're mainly M5s. Are they? Okay. They're mainly M5s, but, but the British all call them Honeys anyway. Yeah, yeah. They're just, that, 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 you know, you, obviously you know where that comes from. That yeah. comes from North Africa, and, the, and you know, the British love them so much because they drove like a little yeah. sweet honey, and, and the kind of name stuck. Because obviously we all called, you know, British always called them after, after Civil War generals. Uh, yes, yeah. So, um, so anyway, so, they, so what you had was, was you had a, an infantry brigade with one armored regiment. And again, the infantry is outranking the armor. Yeah. And then what you would have is you'd have the three three uh, um, saber squadrons of a of a of a um, infantry uh, of an armored regiment, A, B, and C, attached to each of the battalions. Okay. So at every level you're outranked, and that's kind of that was a, a, a bit of a flaw in the system because in the case of the D-Day landings, quite often you'd find a, a situation where. The armor is actually a lot more experienced than the infantry, yeah, yeah. and so the infantry, red, you know, the armored regiment is sort of going, well, well, um, Major General, you know, I, f I think that you should do it like this, and the Major General, no, I'm not listening. Yeah, never, that all, it doesn't always go. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that was the problem, but, but, it was absolutely brutal. I mean, D-Day. I, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at eight-far independent armor brigades, yes. uh, and particularly the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. Oh yeah, famous. And, and they are, and they're such an interesting regiment because they start off the war being kind of effectively like National Guard. They're sort of territorial army, and they go off to war in January 1940 on horses. I mean, they're still on horseback. They're the one non-mechanized bit of the British Army. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't were they the last British horse cavalry unit to conduct a charge in World War II? They weren't actually, but they did in oh, the okay, summer of okay. 1940. They they, uh, yeah, in July 1940, they they um, they had a sabers drawn charger Arab insurrectionists in oh. Palestine. That's where they were posted wow. to. Then they had the horses taken away from them. But but of course, British Army at the start of the Second World War was really really small. Yeah. It's a bit like the U.S. Army. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 189,000 yeah. strong in yep. 1939, for example. Uh, and the British Army is a bit bigger than that, but 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 not huge. And all our kit was left at Dunkirk. Uh, in the beginning of June 1940, when France was defeated and, and Britain sort of scuttled yeah, back across out. the channel. Yeah. So we, had, we didn't have that much kit and we had to grow the army at the same time. Yes, so you're kind of sort of treading water in, with operations in Egypt and stuff that, you know, the Italians attacked in, in, in September 1940, counterattacked by the British in December 1940. 
pushing the Italians back because they weren't much caught. But I mean, you know, it takes time to build up and the Sherwood Rangers suffer from this because they want to mechanize them, but in, there's no tanks to give them. So to start off with, they were actually put over to the, um, to the artillery, which they all found was kind of fantastically in for a dig. <laughs> They're really insulted by this. Yeah. But actually, I think it was a really good move because, you know, what are you offering when you're, when you're a sort of close infantry support? It's fire support, right? Yeah. Yeah. And actually understanding the principles of how artillery works is no bad thing for a tank man. It's not easy. It's not easy. No, it's not easy. And it's, it's not important easy because you know tanks can fire direct and or indirect. American tankers are the same way. They were trained as indirect and our direct fire mode. Right. Yeah. So you know having that little experience, um, and the, and half of the the regiment was stuck at the siege of Tobruk. Okay. In 1941, um, and then they were mechanized at the autumn of 1941. They started training up, training up, and then they did their first battle at the Battle of Alam Halfa, which was very end of August 1942. And this is Rommel's last great effort to try and break through to Egypt and oil fields in the Middle East and all the rest of it. But he doesn't get through. They're blooded as tank men at that battle. Get a bit of a bloody nose, to be perfectly honest. They're still kind of thinking that they're, like they're on horses and sort of charging after the Germans and stuff, and not really understanding at this stage how you operate tanks. But they learn very quickly. And by the battle of Second Battle of Alamein, whoop, Second Battle of Alamein in October through to November 1942, they really start to kind of show their metal. And the really interesting thing is because they're a TA um, outfit, the start of the war, they've got a bunch of people who've been kind of weekend soldiering and stuff yeah, okay. in the in the 1930s. But they've also brought in a whole load of extra um, officers, particularly once they get dismounted, because the whole structure of the regiment changes once you're in tanks. You don't need as many tanks as you do horses. So, yeah. so all of that changes, and they're bringing in a whole load of extra people. And these are guys from all sorts of life. You know, uh, um, so one of the guys I got, whose who's son I'm really good friends with, and who ended up commanding the regiment just a few days after D-Day, is a guy called Stanley Christopherson. Well, you know, he was in the, in the sort of gold mining industry in South Africa, then was a stockbroker, then joined the Inns of Court T um, Yeomanry. That got disbanded, he got posted to the Sherwood Rangers, and he ended up in the Sherwood Rangers. But he's a really smart guy, you know, he wants to get better. Yeah. You can see in his diary that he keeps all through North Africa, they're doing all arms cooperation with the artillery. They're working and training with the infantry, and there's a there's an absolute tangible desire to get better, to learn the lessons. Like the first part of the war, going on horseback on Palestine is all a bit of a lark, you know, playing cricket and days off and, you know, going into Jerusalem and all this kind of stuff and <laughs> not taking it quite as seriously yeah. perhaps as they might have done. But the kind of blooding they get at Alam Halfa, the kind of what they see at Alamein, the long ride across the whole of North Africa into southern Tunisia and everything, they wise up pretty quickly. And by the end of the Tunisian campaign, they've turned themselves into a really decent outfit. They right. really get it. And, the, and the, 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 there's enough sort of squadron sergeants and troop sergeants with really good experience. There's enough officers with really, really good experience. And so they are taken out of 8th Army at the end of the, the North African campaign and earmarked already for the Normandy invasion. Oh, really? Okay. So they get home in kind of autumn 1943, end the very end of 1943, and then they spend that kind of, you know, up to June training. Yep. And so by the time they get to Normandy, they're pretty good. But one of the failings of Normandy is that all these guys are brilliant at jumping in and out of landing craft and getting off LCIs and LCTs. Mm -hmm. What they're not very good at is working together. And although they land with the 50th Division, which are the Tiny Teeth Division, which are pretty, pretty decent, mm -hmm. um, on D-Day itself, soon they find themselves in land. They, they get to Bayer on the evening of the 7th. They take it on the, I mean, on the evening of the 6th, rather, on D-Day itself. On the 7th, they're, they're through Bayer and they're pushed push south and they're asked to take this high point called Point 103, okay. which is about 10 miles or so south of Bayer. And this is a key point because the Canadians and the 50th Infantry Division are fighting the, the 12th SS Hitler Jürgen, yes, who have correct. come up. And it's not it's not a northern southern line, it's an, actually an east west line because the because the, the 12th SS, or I should do it in the opposite direction, are sort of coming from this way, they're coming that way, and it's actually meeting like that. And so what they ask Ape Armour to do, the whole brigade to operate as a brigade without infantry, is to whiz round the back in this sort of low ground and climb up to this high point, 1.103, take it, hold it. And actually, they stay in that area for the best part of a month, the rest, wow, of, the rest wow, of June. Really. But they're coming up against the 12th SS and the Panzerlehr, and these are two of the best yes, armored divisions in the whole of the Wehrmacht. So, yes. you know, the fact that it becomes this attritional slugging match is kind of not surprising. But the challenge they face is that they are, they are operating with, um, with, with a division which is completely new to combat. 
they've, they've done sort of, you know, occupation duties on Iceland. Gr they're green, they're fresh. They're super green, yeah. and you've got this the inventory are outranking them all the time. So they're really experienced, and because Britain is such a small place, and you've suddenly got millions of troops, including Americans mm -hmm, and Canadians yeah. and all the rest of it, and Poles, etc., etc., there's actually not that much room for training and doing all arms, combined arms training, which is, of course, what they need to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what you need to do is, of course, make sure that the D-Day invasion is successful. That's your kind of number one absolute... Just that a little trumps, bit. <laughs> that trumps everything. <laughs> yeah. So that's where the bulk of the training goes in. And of course, that's easier to do. You know, jumping in an Atlantic craft, you can sort of do that okay. Yeah. Lots of beaches in Britain. What there isn't is lots of training places. You know, there's sort of Catterick up in Nor northern Yorkshire. You know, there's Northumberland right up in the north. There's Salisbury Plain, uh, where the first, Berlin, yeah. first, uh, first Infantry Division were training and stuff like that. But there isn't much. And they just don't have any all-arms training. So. The British way traditionally is to learn on the job. Yeah. So you don't have a written doctrine. Well, Americans, you know, we don't tend to, to follow our doctrine as easy. We, right. we do it on the fly as well. Yeah, so you, what you're then dependent on is key personnel, in the case of the Sherwood Rangers, drawing on that experience that they've got from Tunisia. Okay, it's a very different geography here. It's a very different terrain in Normandy to northern Tunisia yeah. and, of course, the Western Desert. But there are certain principles which hold true. You know, which is, you know, make sure you're always looking 360 degrees, which means you're far, far, the far and far again. The key fundamentals. The fundamentals yep. don't change. Nope. And what they've got to do in that period, that sticky period in June where, where the Panzer is fresh and the Hitler Jugend are fresh, is really try and adapt what they do know to this current situation and try and learn how to cooperate better with the infantry and what you find in the reports and diaries and war diaries and stuff through June is lots and lots of grumbling about the infantry not playing ball and hitting the deck at the moment the firing happens and Take how are we going to how are you going to communicate and they're all greenhorns and all that. That starts to change in July 1944 as everyone's starting to get experience and start getting they used start to each molding. other and they're starting to yeah. gel and they're starting to work what, work out what works and what doesn't yeah. and how to cooperate together and the infantry is kind of saying okay okay I recognise these guys do know what they're talking about maybe we should just although, although we kind of outrank them maybe we should just listen to what they've got to say. And you've got this hardcore of people who are just assimilating experience, assimilating uh, um, a sense of cooperation, coordination, mutual trust. You know, they're starting that's, to gel. That's vital. Of combat. course it is, yeah. And, and they start to really, really take off. And, you know, earlier on today, up, uh, up, at, um, up on the bluffs here, I was talking about one particular incident where... John Semkin, who is a major, was commander of A Squadron, equivalent of a company in, in, yep. in your, um, uh, your yeah. tank battalions, um, turns a corner in a road, it's a dead straight road, 350 yards wrong, along, at exactly the same moment a Tiger tank turns around. Uh, a Tiger 1, correct? Uh, Tiger 1, yeah. Yep. You know, with his 88mm gun, it's 100mm armor at the front, and all the rest of it. You know, against a Sherman tank, this is a 75mm yep. main, ta main gun rather than a, uh, an upgun Firefly, and he takes him out. You know, Semkin takes out the Tiger. That's because he's got one up the spout. He's got an armor-piercing round, hits the gun mantlet of the Tiger before the Tiger's fired. Mm -hmm. Spalling goes and hit, blinds the driver. The commander goes into the turret. He can't see anything. By the time he's in the turret, sort of two more rounds of HE of high explosive are pumped in. Ten rounds are fired at the Tiger before the Tiger even gets a chance to let off one. Wow. Oh. And they all uh, hand a hook. You know, and in armored combat, it doesn't matter if it's U.S. or British or Canadian. You know, it's a, the you know it's the theory. You know, you get the first one to get the first shot off. You have a better chance of winning that exactly duel. Exactly that. Yep. Exactly that. Uh, because of course, you know what you what you need, particularly in Normandy, more than what well, you need it anywhere, is that 360 degree yeah, vision. Absolutely. Of course. Yep. Uh, and the moment you go into it, doesn't matter how good your periscopes are. It doesn't matter how much Zeiss icon you've got or whatever. That's no, you know, that is no substitute for actually being able to go like this. And Semkin's got all his guys trained up, and 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 he's got a mentoring system for new for new officers coming in. So they go and join a crew, they learn the ropes, and then they go off on their own. They put them with a really experienced sergeant. They kind of try and not mentor to kind of them, mentor yeah. them in, so that they're not just lambs of slaughter. That they're not these kind of 19-year-olds who are kind of sort of completely green around the gills, sort yeah. of too gung ho. And the good ones will always take their advice from their non-commissioned officers. Right. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And the and the and the ones who aren't come a cropper, and that's the way it goes. Yep. 
But I think, I mean, I just have enormous respect for these guys. I mean, I mean, statistically, the chances of getting through unscathed if you're in an armored unit in the British Army in, in Northwest Europe in 1944-45 is zero. Yeah. Absolutely zero. Every, there's not a single tank that lands on D-Day, which is still running by the, by the end of the day. By the end of the war, oh, I was going to say, but, okay, okay. But, but you know, if you think, you know, 327 men in tanks in an armoured regiment, the 688 men in total, 327 in tanks, including the, 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 the crew of four in each of the 11 mm. uh, um, uh, stewards, honeys. honeys yeah. And there's 36 officers, there's 44 officer casualties just in the Normandy campaign alone. Wow. You know, and it doesn't matter how good you are, and, no. and there is a certain randomness to, 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 to fortune. There's certain things you can do which you can you can sort of mitigate against it. But whether you are lightly wounded, badly Seriously, wounded, yep. lose a limb, get set on fire, die, is actually a total lottery. You, yep, absolutely. You you not control your destiny. You yeah. Know, you cannot control your fate. You can do the best thing you can, especially in an armored vehicle, because you might be rolling down the road and you have no idea, and there could be a Panzer Shrek, Panzer Faust, or an AT gun. You can't control that. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, it's it, it's that's why I think it's important to, that to, you know the tankers and the tankies and how how vital they were to securing you know the, after the uh, the invasion yeah. to Western Europe. Yep. Um, you know, it's, talking about like the uh, independent tank battalions for us that landed on Omaha and D-Day. Yes. They were independent as well. Yeah. So and they, they get, it's the same system, yeah, isn't it? Same system. You yep. know, the armored divisions for us are a little bit more because they're combined arms with you know the CAV and the armored infantry, the yeah, yeah. armored field artillery. Yeah, um, and the TD. Those, the, the independent tank battalions were often getting you know moved all over the oh. place. And the same thing for the American Army with yep. the officers was, hey, you have a beautiful tank, mm. Sherman tank, we need you to go down that way. We think there's something there. Well, in the, you know, in, in British Second Army, it's the God's armors that always, they're the glory boys. You know, and they're, they're the guys who kind of think they're a bit superior to everyone else. Yeah. But they're in the armored divisions, so they're, they're, not in, they're not doing the grinding battle. You know, so what the Sherwood Rangers found was that every time the British Army was in, in you know, making a, a, a new battle, a new front, and launching a new campaign or whatever, they would always be at the spearhead. Oh, yeah. And there's this great yeah. moment when, um, they cross the Rhine in, in, uh, on the 26th of March, 1945. And the guards, were and then they have a pretty sticky fight around the town of Rees in Germany. Okay. Uh, and they, they get through the other side. And then eventually the guards armored push through them. Oh, wow. And they all go, what's your paint? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta love them. You gotta love yeah, them, you gotta right? love them. But they're, they're you know, they, they lose their, the Sherwood Rangers lose their last casualty on the 2nd of May, 1945. They're still losing men right all the oh, way yeah. up, up through. Uh, it's, 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 it's an absolute horror story. When they were crossing the river, so you know, a lot of U.S. armor units, we continued to use the duplex drive Shermans yep. as the campaign progressed through the end of the war as crossing uh -huh. the rivers. Did the British uh, tankies do the same Yeah, they thing? did. They absolutely did. Um, my guys were going over on a, on a pontoon bridge. Okay. Uh, a couple of days later, I think the, the launch of the, the Rhine was, um, was the 23rd of March, so they were kind of three days later okay. on okay. this particular instance. But um, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, they, they were sort of using that. And actually, it's interesting because, you know, you think about the um, 79th Armored Division, which was the kind of Hobart's funnies. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the Americans didn't really go for that in quite the same way. They were, Obviously, they went for the uh, duplex drive. But they didn't do all the other stuff, and they, they didn't have the crocodiles, which is a kind of sort of fearsome beast, this, this Churchill it, it tank. Is, it is a beautiful beast. Well, you yeah. know, it's sort of, you know, could fire 120 feet of worth of, 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 of napalm. I mean, that's quite a long spout. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and all the, the, the fascine carriers and the, and the, the bunker busters yep, and all yep. the others, the interesting thing is that they're such a feature of the British and, and Canadian effort on D-Day, and then everyone sort of forgets about them. Oh, and absolutely. they're interesting because it's, as a division, they never operate as a division. Yeah, they're, they're all kind of parceled out. <clears throat> but they are absolutely key to every single action. And there's a, a very interesting action at Geilenkirchen in November 1944, um, which is the, uh, I think it's the 85th, is it 85th or the 84th Rail Splitters Infantry okay. Division? They're, they're brand new. They've arrived in theatre in, in, in October 1944, straight into battle, but they're given British armour to support them. Oh, really? And, and leading the way are the flails, you know, the sort of mine yep, kicker yep. uppers <clears throat> and, and then the, the bunker busters and stuff and the crocodiles with the Sherwood Rangers and the other tanks of 8th Armored Brigade. They're operating alongside the Americans absolutely as one. Yeah, it's, it's one team, one fight. Right. And that was the most important thing and even to this day, um, you know, and so working together, training together and also learning because it's kind of unique. We're at Conneaut, Ohio, yeah. uh, with the uh, Normandy D-Day reenactment, yep. um, and then also the, all the living history throughout this massive uh, event. Is you know once the United States Army approved you know for a priority AAA 
uh, for production of the uh, duplex drive Sherman yep. on the M4A1. Did you know where they were actually uh, built here in the United States? Well, yeah. They were in Ohio. No uh, way. And one of them is uh, not too far away. It was Firestone, a tire. Oh, motor yes, company. in uh, Akron. In Akron, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of very neat. And so, you know, as we talk and teach about the uh, U.S. Army tankers on D Day, we always tell everyone, did you, you know, Akron, not too far away, and a couple other towns in Ohio where they provided approximately 200 M4A1 duplex drives. That's amazing. So which, you know, played a vital part for the, you know, not the U.S. Army landing on. Uh, uh, D-Day. Yeah, and of course you got the Fisher Building as well in Cleveland, which was producing, you know, Shermans by the dozen. I mean, you know, by the thousand, really. I mean, it's just it's incredible. The, I mean, I'm, I'm just totally in awe of, of U.S. production. I mean, I thought British were pretty good, all things considered. But, but, but America, you know, Willow Run and every, everything Liberty just, ships being built in four days and everything just hours. Everything just stopped, you know. It was, yeah, you know, it was amazing. providing for our military, but also our allies under right. the Lend Lease Act. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, all production companies, all factories were producing, you know, war materials. Oh, that's incredible. Some of our machine guns, at least one in particular for our uh, museum here at World War II Armor, yeah. uh, you'll never guess uh, who made the 50 cal machine gun. Who? Frigidaire. No. Out of a refrigerator so? company. Yeah, it's it's insane. I had no idea. It's you know, and so as uh, stewards of history, as we take in these pieces, we preserve them, yep. we restore them, we learn all about their history, and it's important that we you know continue to uh, educate and teach through publications, online, and also events such as this. Don't you yeah. agree? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think it's also it's really important that, that people understand how war works in the whole. So you know, we've just been talking about an individual regiment. I've been yeah. talking about John Semkin. He's an individual. Of course, you never ever lose sight of that. This is ultimately about individuals, people, you know, with loves and lives and family and all the rest of it who are kind of making the ultimate sacrifice, and more often than not. But it's also about that operational level, yeah. how you fight, how, you know, you've got the big overall strategy, you've got the tactical level, which is the guys in the tank, yeah. then you've got the operational level, which is the glue which sticks the strategic aims to the tactical reality. Uh, and that operational level is very often not taught. It, 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 it's left out of the books, it's left out of the documentaries, it's left out of the movies. You just don't understand how it happens. It's just some guys in a tank, the tank just happens to be there. Yeah. But actually that, that production chain, that long tail, it's what I call big war. Absolutely. And in the case of the Allies, that's about using steel, not flesh. And that's a much bigger ideology, much bigger principle, which actually is to try and reduce the number of guys who are having to kind of charge across a field, you know, mm -hmm. put their necks on the line. You're trying to reduce that by industrial mount and, uh, might and maintenance of the aim. And again, you know, one of the, one of the great things about Something like the Sherman is just so, so it's such a utility that tank. Is, yeah. it's, it's so easy to change in the field compared to interchangeable know, parts. Yeah, and, yeah, I yeah. Mean, look, okay, here we are. I mean, just look at look at the suspension. Okay, if you want to go to a Panther, you've got to get through thirty six wheels, eighty wheels, or whatever yeah. to get off before you even get to it, and then it's really complex. The great thing about having the the suspension bogies on the outside is, you know, one gets bust, you just can take it right off, it off, put yep. another one on. You know, you've got the, the the transmission at the front. It's a lot of bolts Unbolting there, but it, take it, it out. Th yep. Uh, engine at the back, lift it up. Little crane because it's quite small compared to a Tiger. Uh, for Thirty tons, not fifty six. You can just pull it out. For personal experience doing this. Definitely have to have a good crane. Yep. Right, right, right. You need a good yep. crane, but if you've got a tiger tank, you need an even bigger crane. Oh, even bigger. <coughs> so it's that maintenance of the effort. Of course, if you're going forward as well, you can then the battle space is yours, so you can then clear it all off. I mean, you know, one of one of the sort of black marks of the Normandy campaign is Operation Goodwood. Yes. You know, where they sort of the British lose 400 tanks in one day, but no one ever says that actually, you know. 250 of them or something were, were back in action 48 yeah, hours later. That's because they're so easy to repair and you can get them back up. Yeah. You know, and a lot of folks don't realize, you know, uh, the German forces, they, you know, they could roll their vehicles out of the factory onto a railhead and move closer to the battlefield. Yep. Whereas, you know, for the United States here, we had two oceans and we had yes. both sides of the world to go yeah, to. Yeah, so yeah. Everything that came out of the factory. One of the most important things on a Sherman. Absolutely. You know, it had it had to be ready to go and interchangeable yep. for ease of maintenance because we can't just send it across the Atlantic right. Ocean yep. and bring it back for you know an oil change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yep. Yeah, and a very good reason why you don't want the gun too big. Absolutely, and it fits on a Liberty ship. It kind of makes sense why the Sherman continued to see you know, service post World War II. Well, in, during Korean War and uh, with other countries yeah, yeah. around the world for many years. And if I'm, I'm not mistaken, there, I believe there's still a couple countries in South America that still have some on the books. Is that so? Um, I mean, well, for, I'm not surprised. Yep. I mean, for 80 years old, she's a beautiful machine. And, you know, it's uh, it's great to have you here with us at D-Day Con. Wow. It, well, no, it's, it's been a privilege. And uh, it means a lot to uh, Rabbi Rob, our managing director and owner of World War II Armor. 
And uh, we hope you uh, have a safe trip back across the pond and look forward to doing well, thanks, uh, future events. Yeah, 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 I'm game. Yep, so thanks, Jim. Cheers. Yep, and uh, make sure everybody, uh, you know, James Holland, uh, has several wonderful uh, publications that you know, you can get on Amazon or different book distributors and also online. Uh, he has a wonderful podcast and as well several videos on YouTube. So thanks again, Jim. Well, my pleasure.